Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you to the latest in our series of Eno Center for Transportation webinars. My name is Robert Puentes. I'm the president and CEO of Eno. Uh, and just so we all know, our mission at Eno is to shape public debate on critical multimodal transportation issues and build a network of innovative transportation professionals. Um, and I'm really happy for today's webinar to be joined, at least virtually, by Henry Grabar. Henry is staff writer at is a staff writer at Slate, where he writes on housing, on transportation, and the environment. He was the editor of the Future of Transportation Anthology a few years ago, and most recently is the author of Paved Paradise, How Parking Explains the World, which was published earlier this spring to excellent reviews. I'm sure you all have seen. Uh, he's here to talk about the book, uh, which, is, which is really good, and I don't think I'm blowing up his spot um, by emphasizing that in it, Henry is really making the case that, that parking is a, is a primary determinant for how people live, how they work, and for how places function. Um, you know, I do a lot of work here in the DC region, planning and development issues, and I can tell you parking is by far the most dominant, re the most dominant topic that comes up uh, as we try to redevelop um, and, and, and rehabilitate some places. What I really like um, about the book is Henry's uh, use of relatable stories uh, and people to both describe the absurdity of some of the parking policies that exist, um, but also to talk about uh, possible ways of, of reform. So um, really, really excellent kind of background on, on how things got to where they are, but also so I, I think some hope here for the future. So Henry is gonna present for a bit, and then after that, we're gonna take questions. So please use the Q&A widget at the bottom left uh, corner of your screen. If it's not there at the bottom left, you can probably find it, the Q&A widget. You can uh, put questions in there anytime. You don't have to wait until Henry is done to ask questions, and we will go to those um, once he's finished. So thank you again for joining us here today. With that, take it over, Henry. Thank you very much, Robert, for that fantastic introduction. Um, it's very exciting for me to get to present to, uh, at, virtually at least, the Eno Center for Transportation, um, first, because I have a hunch already that the people in attendance at this webinar are already in a rarefied tier of parking and transportation knowledge. Um, and so I'm excited to hear from you about your thoughts about this issue. And I think we're, we'll, we'll be able to um, probably skip past um, the more typical comments you might hear about parking at a community meeting or a public library. Um, it's also exciting because uh, William Phelps Eno, who was the founder of the Eno Center for Transportation, was a major figure in establishing uh, consensus about what to do about traffic and parking in mid-century American cities. Uh, he, in fact, wrote that, quote, premature decentralization, which was how at the time uh, planners referred to um, businesses, people, industries moving out to the suburbs, was brought about by the failure to provide, quote, ample parking facilities. Um, and this, uh, at the time, was a very mainstream view. And we'll talk about this in a moment, but it really helps explain um, a lot of the uh, subsequent trends in American urban development. And um, so I, I, it's it's cool to feel like I'm in dialogue with, with the ghost of Eno um, as it pertains to parking. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, one of the first questions that I get often when I talk about parking is, okay, if there's so much parking, and 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 I think many of us know that there there is a lot of parking. Estimates are that there are at least three spaces per car, and most of those cars, or at least some of those cars, are in motion. So in reality, the national parking stock is never more than thirty three percent full, and maybe uh, most of the time a bit less than that. Um, and then people ask, well, okay, well, why can't then I find a parking space? And I feel like this graphic is a useful one that keeps coming up when I talk to people about parking. And uh, I think the most basic reason is that Americans have incredibly high standards for parking. They want parking to be free. Um, they want it to be convenient, which is to say directly in front of their destination. And they want it to be immediately available at the moment they arrive. And those three standards are very, very difficult to meet. As I think this Venn diagram demonstrates, we more typically end up uh, with environments that um, 
meet one of the, or sorry, two of the three uh, elements of this trilemma and, uh, and finding someplace uh, that satisfies all three parking conditions is like finding the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, there are other reasons, of course, beyond our high expectations that parking is plentiful but feels scarce. Um, it is underpriced as uh, Donald Shoup would, um, would, would tell you, and his book, The High Cost of Free Parking, is an excellent primer on that subject. Um, it is not shared between different and complementary uses, so that uh, even on a street with lots of parking on paper, um, some of that parking might be reserved for a condo, some for a courthouse, some for a movie theater, uh, some for a sandwich shop, and so on, even though those uh, various uses aren't all uh, active and busy at the same time. Uh, and then finally, parking is sort of hard to find. I think in a lot of American cities, we have this sense that parking is something that um, that is acquired. Uh, the knowledge of where a good parking spot is, is hard won local knowledge. Um, when in fact, uh, we should be making it as evident as possible to anybody who drives into town where they should park, where they should expect to park um, and pay for it, and, and where they should expect to park uh, for free. Um, to reduce the amount of time they spend looking for parking. Next slide. So let's go back in time a little bit. Um, this is a cartoon from the Los Angeles Times, 1945. I don't know if you can see this on your screens, but there's a little uh, flag affixed to the gorilla's arm that says downtown parking problem. And this indeed is, to my mind, an accurate summary of the way the downtown business leaders perceived um, the challenge of providing enough parking uh, as World War II was ending and um, American cities were beginning to expect that the long-awaited period of revitalization, renewal, and investment that had been delayed first by the Great Depression and then by the war was about to begin. So um, they really did think that uh, parking was the great challenge facing um, their revitalization. And one of the reasons uh, for this was that, um, sorry, is it, are we having trouble seeing these slides? What do you think? Looks good on this end. Go ahead and keep going. Okay. Well, imagine a cartoon of a hulking King Kong style gorilla looming over downtown Los Angeles. This was a cartoon in the Los Angeles Times in November 1945. And uh, again, represents the consensus view because cities were deluged with traffic. And uh, the thinking in part established by Eno himself and other traffic experts of the time uh, was that this traffic at its root was really a parking problem. Uh, people would get stuck in traffic because there was nowhere to park. Um, they would spend lots of time circling the block looking for parking, parking and then uh, often they would double park. Um, and, uh, and that double parking was also obviously a contributor to uh, the traffic problem. So cities basically um, did absolutely everything they could do to create more parking. Part of that took the form of gigantic city-sponsored garages like um, the uh, garage beneath Pershing Square in Los Angeles, Grant Park in Chicago, uh, practically every city has one. Um, and, and then also, uh, of course, it was parking was a major component in urban renewal projects, um, not only because, uh, you know, somewhat controversially parking was left out of the interstate highway program. And so when a lot of these projects got built, they got built without parking garages to the dismay of, uh, of some um, urban leaders. But nevertheless, uh, urban renewal did create a lot of through Title I and, and Otherwise, a lot of very auto-friendly spaces and, and the developments built under urban renewal tended to have lots of uh, space to park as well. Um, but then finally, next slide. Finally, there was uh, the implementation of parking minimums. And again, uh, as, as Donald Shoup has shown, uh, parking minimums had an absolutely uh, cataclysmic effect on the style of architecture and urbanism that had predominated leading up to the Second World War. Um, basically what this amounts to, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept, uh, zoning provision in every zoning code in pretty much every city and suburb in the United States, uh, saying that um, every, 
every city had to require or every sorry every developer would be required to build a certain number of parking spaces uh, corresponding um, to each uh, conceivable use of land, uh, whether it was a new building or a renovated building that was taking on a new use. And um, what I'm showing here, in case the slides still aren't working, is a image of uh, uh, the, the table of contents in the parking generation manual, which is where these um, standards got codified, shared, um, and collected. And uh, you just, you, you have to see it to understand uh, just how specific it is. It's not just saying everybody needs some parking, but it uh, it goes into every conceivable use and delineates between uses that don't seem to uh, require um, that kind of exactitude. Like what's the difference between a soccer complex, tennis courts, a racket club, a health club, an athletic club, like all of these are independent entries in the parking generation manual, um, which just goes to show how um, fanatically uh, precise and detailed these specifications were, um, if not accurate. And that's an important part of this because it's not just that we, uh, starting in the 1950s and 60s, subjected every new development to this car-centric logic that there be two parking spaces for every apartment and one for every 300 square feet of office space and so on and so forth, um, but, al but also that those requirements were um, designed to park every site to maximum standards, uh, busiest possible time of day, busiest possible use of the land. And, and what we ended up with was not only a lot of um, car, car oriented land use, both in cities and, and outside of them, uh, but also a lot of waste, uh, a lot of unused parking. And survey after survey has shown that uh, whether you're looking at housing developments or offices or pretty much any other land use, uh, a lot of this required parking goes empty. And again, going back to the question of uh, our high standards for parking, um, we we want it that way because we we demand parking satisfaction. And and so to some extent, this is a a, a trap of our own making. Um, that that every use must be parked to twice its um, you know average occupancy. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so um, these images make the rounds on Twitter and Facebook every so often, but um, I thought I'd share a few them here. Uh, the Parking Reform Network, by the way, recently put out a really great deck of um, slides showing uh, satellite views of major American downtowns and the portion of land that has been dedicated to parking. And uh, it tends to be a large portion of downtown, sometimes as much as 30% of the parcels are parking. And when I say that, I, I'm talking about pure parking uses. I'm talking about um, parcels that are uh, exclusively dedicated to parking, uh, not even including the parking that may be lurking on the ground floor of a multifamily building or the garage that takes up the you know top you know the bottom two floors of a hotel or something like that. Um, and also, uh, it doesn't include obviously <laughs> all the spots on the street, um, which 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 tend to be many. Um, but this just shows you uh, across a, a, a few cities um, how much land we're we're dedicating to parking uh, in Los Angeles County. It's an absolutely gargantuan. Uh, tile of land uh, that's been dedicated to parking. In Atlanta, it's just an enormous quantity of the parcels downtown. And then in, in both Philadelphia and Seattle, which are on the bottom left here, um, it's not just, uh, it's not just um, parking lots that tend to be or garages adjacent to uh, major, you know, like a football stadium or a downtown office building. There's also a lot of parking nestled within neighborhoods that are traditionally considered to have a parking shortage. And again, there have been studies about this, but even in places that think they have parking shortages, um, there often is in fact enough parking uh, for everyone to find space. So um, that is important background as we begin to consider the consequences of, um, of this regime of requiring so much parking. Next slide. So this is a, a terrific little drawing that was done by uh, Alfred Tu, the illustrator who um, drew some of the drew the drew the illustrations for my book, and I think it uh, succinctly shows the way that parking requirements, or if not required, then simply choices to provide parking, 
influence the form of the urban environment um, because most parking is provided at surface level uh, because that's the cheapest way to do it. As the parking requirements go up in proportion to the square footage, um, you have to make difficult decisions about how much of your land can actually be occupied by your building. And so you lose um, the uh, traditional Main Street vernacular in which uh, buildings uh, abut the sidewalk and, uh, and, and each other um, and, and in a sort of line of uh, uninterrupted storefronts uh, because that format becomes impossible when you begin to require parking. And especially in a Main Street context, um, parking requirements for commercial uh, uses and especially for restaurant uses tend to be really, really high. So if you wanted to turn some old downtown bank building into a brewery or something like that, which is something that happens all the time in, uh, in, in, in American towns, um, you're going to have a lot of trouble uh, making that work without tearing down the two adjacent structures. And that has really taken a lot of the uh, historic fabric out of some of our downtowns. And I think this is one of those cases where uh, everybody, of course, wants their parking, but they also resent, I think, uh, the type of development that, um, that that requires. And they don't maybe make the connection between having that ample parking and losing uh, that sort of, uh, you know, traditional Main Street, grandma and grandpa's house kind of um, environment, uh, which, which most Americans do, uh, do, do seem to enjoy. Um, so you can see as the parking requirements go up, uh, we um, lose that traditional urbanism and, and move towards something uh, closer to um, a drive through in a, in a strip mall. Next slide. And this is a slide or um, this proliferates across uh, the entire urban environment. And um, this was a concept that was um, introduced to me by Peyton Chung, the developer who was um, Describing the way that, uh, as we possible to build uh, densely, right? We continue to build lots of tall buildings, including in places that are very car oriented and have very high parking requirements. It's just that in those places, uh, the development that gets built, um, the land values are high enough to justify massive structured or even underground parking garages. Um, and so you get this sort of new architectural typology in the 1960s, say, in which a building sits atop a podium of parking, and that persists to this day. I mean, if you go to downtown Fort Worth or Austin or really any booming Sunbelt city, you will see buildings that are designed like this, um, where the actual building uh, sits atop a parking garage. Uh, of course, we already talked about um, sprawl on the left, where uh, surface parking is will, will do the job because land values are low enough. Um, but what's really missing uh, from this picture and from the urban development picture in the United States at large is the middle, right? It's, it's, and this is the valley of the high parking requirement. You can justify the cost of a structured garage, which by the way, uh, the average stall in a structured garage uh, in, in the United States last year was about a little under $30,000. But again, that's an average. And if you're looking at a high cost city like Boston or Seattle, um, it's gonna be a lot higher than that and underground, it's a lot higher still. So you really do need to have a, um, be shooting at a, a pretty high tier in terms of rents uh, to justify that kind of construction. Um, and, then, and then if your land values aren't quite that high, uh, you're not gonna justify building a garage and, uh, and, and the lot is gonna be mostly surface parking. And so what you lose there in the middle is what is now um, commonly referred to as missing middle housing which is a big reason why the country finds itself short 4 million homes, because um, those types of units, infill units, um, mid-rise buildings, et cetera, and you have to include all this parking, um, especially in an infill environment where um, the amount of land is limited. Next slide. Finally, uh, our obsession with parking has massive consequences for neighborhood politics, I think, we're all familiar with the situation that Rob described at the beginning of this uh, session where at a neighborhood meeting, people will say, um, people will say, you know, well, we like this building, but what about the parking? Or we're not opposed to new neighbors, but what about the parking? And uh, I think this has become a pretty dominant um, 
way of objecting to new development in uh, American cities, uh, the feeling that new neighbors should have to pay uh, for what old neighbors get for free. New neighbors should have to pay for parking in their own developments um, built into their rents because old neighbors are entitled to the free parking on the street. And I think this is um, uh, a, a, an element in American neighborhood politics that we would do well to recognize and, and try to um, move past, uh, if at all possible. Next slide. Uh, and time after time, we find these housing developments that get blocked by neighbors' concerns about parking. Now, this may be changing as more and more cities decide to repeal their uh, parking requirements, but what's not changing is that um, lots of cities still have land use rules that require discretionary approval, approval from a city council person, a few community meetings, et cetera. And these are the moments at which um, neighbors uh, raise their voices and object to uh, new buildings um, for, for lack of parking. And um, that is certainly their right to do so, but I think we ought to recognize that it is in fact serving as a, as a major impediment on our, our ability to, to build more housing and precisely to build more housing in the places where, uh, where people might not need a car to do absolutely everything. And, and those really are the places we ought to be trying to densify, uh, not just for climate reasons to get people driving less, but also because they tend to be um, inner, you know, uh, close in high opportunity neighborhoods with good access to jobs and amenities. Next slide. Of course, people say, uh, well, without my uh, parking, I won't be able to go around and do anything in my life. I, I need my parking and I need my car. And I think Part of the tragedy of this is that, you know, obviously most Americans do need a car to get to work um, and we're not going to turn the entire country into uh, Amsterdam overnight. Certainly not. But on a neighborhood by neighborhood level, there's lots and lots of trips that get made that are really short and that could conceivably be made in some other way than in a car. And in fact, the obsession with providing parking makes it challenging to permit those trips to be made on foot, on bicycle or in a bus because the actual provision of on-street parking takes away our ability to provide a bus lane, makes it challenging to provide a bike lane, et cetera. And again, these are disputes you hear in, in communities all the time. Well, I don't want a bike lane because I don't want to lose these parking spaces. I don't want a bus lane because I don't want to lose these parking spaces and so on. Uh, next slide. Very concrete example of this is uh, daylighting intersections, which is like um, transportation policy 101 to make streets for kids to cross, right? A car is approaching the corner and you really want to uh, take away the parking spots that are right adjacent to the crosswalk to improve the sight lines for the approaching driver so they can see if someone's about to cross the street, especially if that someone is, um, you know, only three and a half out over the, the hood of an SUV. Um, but of course, we don't do this in most places. And the reason we don't do this is because uh, taking away those parking spots is perceived as a political third rail. And if a couple of people have to be hit in the crosswalk in the meantime, well, um, that's a price that we collectively have decided that we're willing to pay. Next slide. But then even more holistically, I think that um, because we have become so accustomed to seeing the streets as perpetually lined with car storage, as if that had always been the way that they were, um, it can be a little hard to even comprehend what happens when you begin to design streets in a different way. Um, this is a street in Chicago in the Little Italy neighborhood, which I just happened upon. And I think you you see that the parking has been sacrificed in order to create a, a narrow street that's really just the width of, of one car passing. And um, and it's become a kind of a hangout area where, you know, kid plays tetherball or at least looks at the tetherball on the sidewalk and uh, parents are sort of walking between the median row of trees and the uh, a public space that's beginning to take shape. And, um, and, and that's the kind of thing that I think can begin to replace um, the row of uh, parked cars on, on the street. Of course, there are um, a billion other options. Next slide. One of which was uh, the streeteries, which took shape in um, 2020 during the pandemic, 
And um, now I know these have been rolled back in a lot of places in places like Philadelphia and Boston. They've decided, well, we don't actually um, want these anymore. Our parking is more important. Um, so there has been some retrenchment on this issue. But I, I do think that at a fundamental level uh, for people who are interested in this kind of issue, this has opened people's eyes to the possibility that this land uh, might be used for something else. And in fact, the sales tax that gets generated restaurants rather than parking, it's something like, uh, it's a multiple of, of, it's a two digit multiple over the meter revenue in terms of the amount of revenue that's generated for the city. So it's it's not only um, creates a more pleasant, in my opinion, urban environment, um, but it gives people a place to hang out outside, but, uh, but um, it also, uh, it's a good decision as as well. Next slide. Uh, and then and then, you know, thinking even more abstractly, we can begin to imagine like what might happen if we were to decide that these streets could be free to park cars. Um, this is a block party in uh, Brooklyn's Bedford Stuyvesant neighborhood. And uh, you can see here that, you know, it, it's it's not like um, this couldn't happen with the parked cars there, but uh, the park cars uh, also, they, they sort of, they they create a barrier between the two sides of the street. And with them gone, uh, people um, really make the, make the block their own. And again, whether it's um, uh, patio seating or uh, a block party or some sort of more abstract concept of public space, there are so many things that we could begin to do with this space. Um, one I've been thinking about a lot recently is uh, planting more trees and greenery, um, not only to provide more shade and, and clean the air, but also um, to begin to soak up stormwater, which seems to be uh, a, a more serious problem. And we've seen so many flash floods just in the last couple of weeks in the United States in urban areas where, you know, I'm not saying that um, removing parked cars and, and planting um, uh, planting a bunch of, uh, you know, water absorbent stuff is, is going to stop those from happening. But but it's but it's a, certainly a step in the right direction to um, to help manage the fact that our uh, sewers are not equipped to handle these new climate change uh, caused rainstorms. And uh, and and then obviously also would make the street a more pleasant place. Next slide. And I'll uh, conclude this short presentation with uh, a slide from Paris where um, one of the things that's been done as part of the mayor's initiative to try and take away as many parking spaces from the curb as possible is um, turning streets in front of schools into public space. And this is what this represents here. Um, you know, you can see that it's, it's uh, the street actually isn't technically closed to traffic. If you have an errand to run or you have something to drop off or you need to uh, pick up um, someone who with reduced mobility to take them to a doctor's appointment or something like that, you can open these gates and just drive down the street. But what's really changed is that the parked cars are gone and people really make this street their own, whether it's a biker, kids playing soccer, uh, people walking with their shopping carts or their suitcases or what have you. And, uh, and I think this, you know, this is one of those ideas that shows that, um, this is the kind of thing that could be adapted really to any American neighborhood. It's not, uh, it, it doesn't require a city in which nobody ever uses their car again, right? I mean, most neighborhoods actually have plenty of on-street parking spaces and plenty of garage spaces, um, uh, but but here and here and here and there, we probably could afford um, to, to think about converting some, some public space into new uses uh, by getting rid of the parking. And uh, that concludes my short presentation. And, and now uh, I think Rob and I are going to have a short conversation. Yeah, it's fantastic. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, and thank you for, for, the, for the slides and the, the images. It's, it's, um, it, it's certainly a topic that has generated a lot of interest, um, not just here in the presentation, but broadly. And as you noted, judging from the audience and from the, um, the questions we have coming in, a lot of interest from our, from our participants here. So I'm going to try to group some of these, um, some of these comments in together to, and to, to collect into a couple of big themes that I think we've seen here. And I'm really glad that you talked about the, you know, kind of the, the, the very contemporary nature of this. I think that clearly since the, the pandemic, things have, have changed quite a bit. As you noted, you know, during COVID with the streeteries and things, a lot of uh, experiments with with parking reform and easing some restrictions for restaurants and things that I think has resulted in some interesting um, 
some interesting reforms. I'm glad you talked about safety and, and again, these slides with the schools is very compelling. I think probably can get folks to um, to conceptualize this in, in a very different way. But let's start big and broad just for a second, just um, uh, thinking about the questions that are coming in. Talk about the differences between this conversation in the U.S. between cities and suburbs, right? So, you know, obviously very different built environment, very different role of parking. But, you know, how does that play out between the dense urban areas and kind of the developing suburbs on the, on the outskirts? Sure. I actually think suburbs are probably the uh, the low hanging fruit for parking reform at this point. Um, and that's because they they really, truly have enough parking for everybody to park. I mean, um, suburbs are not that much more car dependent than American cities at this point, where lots and lots of people own cars, even in places that are considered to be relatively um, transit friendly, like, you know, Chicago or something like that. Right. Um, and so I think in, in the suburbs, you, you really have a lot of potential um, to uh, begin to rethink the way people think about the curb. Um, obviously, building housing in the suburbs is of paramount importance in really uh, housing challenge metro areas like uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And um, if that housing is going to get built in the suburbs, I think the best thing would be for it to be built uh, around transit, close to commercial destinations and all that. And preferably uh, without a required amount of parking, which will surely not only um, uh, add to the cost of the housing, go 30% unused probably. And then finally, uh, encourage lots of people to make decisions on the margin about car ownership um, uh, in, in, in favor of buying a car, right? Because this is one thing we know about providing parking is that uh, the more parking you provide, the more likely people will be uh, to own cars and to drive them. Now, obviously, people living in the suburbs are going to need cars to go about uh, their business and, and certainly to get to work. Um, but we, uh, but again, these decisions are being made on the margin. And we're talking about a household with three cars that might conceivably uh, get by with just two or a household with two cars that might get by with just one uh, and so on. And, and that, you know, that should be up to people who, uh, who live in these units to, to decide uh, whether they, they, they want to um, pay, for, pay for two parking spots or not. And for many years and, and still today in most suburbs in the United States, that's not a choice that anybody has um, because the parking is, is required. Um, suburbs are also places where, especially in the remote work era, um, you're going to have a lot of trips that are being made uh, relatively locally. And it could conceivably be made without a car um, with some, you know, modest safe streets improvements, which uh, we've been really, really slow at making in this country. Um, and I think that's that's pretty important too. Now, in cities where um, car ownership might actually be optional, there's obviously a lot of urgency um, to build more housing in, in, in many of them. And, uh, and, and there, I think most, uh, more and more cities have decided that parking should be optional when developers are, developers are, are deciding what to do. Um, but of course, the, the problem doesn't get just solved there, right? If the parking on the street remains free, um, then you run the risk of creating a situation where uh, you run into a, a bona fide parking shortage, uh, like you might see in uh, parts of Philadelphia, for example. And, and there I know um, they're doing a lot of development without parking, which is great, but, um, but they still haven't figured out a way to regulate street space. And I think those two things do sort of have to go hand in hand. And if you keep building a bunch of housing without parking, um, without making the concurrent safe streets improvements, and without um, finding a way to regulate uh, those street spaces, you're going to wind up with a, a huge backlash and a lot of angry neighbors. Indeed, and I think that, and coupling that with the, with the housing question is what I like about the, the way you frame the book and frame the, the context here. It's not just about parking, but all the impacts that it has. And, and in your book, you talk a lot about affordable housing and the, the housing crisis that we have. And I think you did a good job talking about that here. Um, are there any places that have successfully, or do you know of any places that have kind of decoupled the costs of parking with housing? Um, to your point, if folks who may be in the inner suburbs or in the city who may not have a car, may not need a car to bring down the cost of housing. Is there a way to decouple those those costs? Well, one example of that is um, the adaptive reuse ordinance that um, got passed in downtown Los Angeles in the 1999. And that created an opportunity for developers to renovate a bunch of historic structures, mostly office buildings that have been built in the 
tens, twenties, um, forties that had sat empty for 60, well, not 60 years, but had sat empty for decades, um, often, or, or had been really minimally used and were no longer really useful as office spaces in other cities like Philadelphia, Chicago, New York, they'd been converted into, um, residential units, but, uh, but, but that hadn't happened in Los Angeles, uh, for a variety of reasons. One of which was that the city required, um, two parking spaces per unit with, uh, any new, um, you know, converted uh, condo building. So uh, one thing that happened in downtown LA was they waived that requirement in 1999 and they saw a, a boom in, in conversions and all these old buildings got converted into new residential structures and they added thousands and thousands of new units into the downtown LA housing market. Now, some of those came with parking spaces, but often it was parking um, that was not provided for every unit. And so it was a, uh, an additional cost that you would opt into uh, in your lease or uh, when you made your purchase uh, in favor of, of that, um, in favor of getting that, that space. Um, but then the more, more common thing that happened, I think, was that people found parking arrangements uh, in the neighborhood, which was quite easy because downtown Los Angeles has one of the largest concentrations of garage parking in the entire world. I mean, it's there are massive, massive garages everywhere because it's a major employment center. Um, and so for people who were moving into these buildings, um, parking was effectively decoupled from the cost of housing and they could decide separately uh, to purchase a parking space, rent a parking space in a nearby garage. And, um, I, you know, we haven't seen a study on what the car ownership rates are of the people who moved into these buildings, but everything we have seen, uh, we all the data we've collected about this suggests that um, having people think, uh, having that parking cost become unbundled from housing and, and forcing people to say, all right, do I want to spend another $300 um, every month on a, well, that, those might be New York City prices, but you know, $150, let's say on a, on a parking space, um, that begins to function on the margins as a disincentive to car ownership. Questions are coming in here pretty fast. This is um, great questions too. Uh, but just to build off that last one, just one more that, that I, I, and I have seen this too, I know that it exists that where local officials who may have parking um, ratios and parking minimums that are uh, outdated or maybe in need of reform, won't do it because that's a good bargaining chip for developers when they come in. If developers come in and they don't want to, for lots of different reasons, don't want to to build for the expensive parking that's there, will sometimes negotiate for maybe affordable housing or some kind of um, you know, additional benefit. Have you seen anything like that? And is that a, is that a problem or is that an opportunity? You think? Uh, I think it's a problem. Um, that was a major impediment in California to passing the state's. Um, bill that uh, eventually abolished parking requirements within a half mile of frequent transit. Michael Manville, the UCLA professor who's work, who has worked both on the ARO and downtown LA and on this, um, calls this pretextual planning where you use a pretext <laughs> like uh, parking requirements to negotiate over the thing you really want, which is say uh, affordable housing or, or some other sort of concession from a developer. Um, and I, I think he makes the case, and I agree with him, that it's just simply a bad way to go about governing. I mean, if you, if what you want is um, affordable housing included in every new development, then you should just pass a law requiring that uh, rather than negotiating uh, one off over, over parking. And I think the larger point is that um, this theory that we should uh, make the laws as onerous as possible so that with every new development, we can embark on a new um, uh, rounds of negotiation is uh, adds an enormous cost onto doing business um, and, and functions as a, as, a, as a real drag on housing production because um, people should, you know, there should be a clear set of rules. The rules can be what they what they should be. But then uh, once they're in place, uh, you have to let people, you know, play by those rules um, rather than embark on this uh, endless series of meetings and negotiations. And I think among other things, not only does that slow down the process of uh, housing approvals, but it also leads to a lot of corruption and backroom dealing because you just create a, a situation in which developers are, are um, looking to uh, local politicians on every project for approval. And, and it's not an accident that, that city council politicians uh, really, really love this system. 
I haven't seen that part, but I've certainly seen it being used. And and the uncertainty or uncertainty for developers, uh, as you mentioned, is, is is certainly something that is probably prob probably problematic. Um, how about the lending community when they when they think about you know, you know, the projects that they are um, loaning money for and financing? How do they think about the things that you're talking about here? Are they are they are they um, kind of on the on the, the spearhead of parking reform kind of ideas? Are they very traditional? Are there are there good models? How how does the lending community think about this? Uh, they they tend to be pretty conservative. I talked to a lot of developers who told me horror stories about trying to convince their bank to lend them money for parking for excuse me for a project without parking, um, taking them to see comparative you know comps really like uh, and and still having to look far and wide. I think because this type of development has been illegal in most cities for sixty years, so it is sort of novel. Um, and, and so, uh, banks tend to be pretty conservative about that kind of thing. Um, but obviously that is beginning to change and in the cities where, um, parking requirements have been waived for, you know, five, 10 years now, like, um, like Seattle, for example, um, did away with them uh, around in certain areas about 10 years ago, you have seen a lot of development taking place where builders are not building, uh, up to the previously required amount of parking. Now they're not, they're often not building no parking. Um, but they're just building what they think they need. And uh, and that, you know, that's not, um, that's already a really significant um, piece of reform. And uh, the calculation that I saw for Seattle was that that reform has saved builders from building half a billion dollars uh, in parking spaces uh, in just a few years. That's a great stat. That's, that is something I think that would be compelling for not just the lending community, but for local officials to understand. Um, Again, not surprising from this audience, a lot of questions around kind of new mobility tools. Let me let me get to that in just a second. I want to first uh, talk about, um, you know, obviously, here in Washington, there's a major push for electrification of the vehicle fleet um, and electric vehicle chargers are, are a major topic of conversation. How do you think about EVs and EV charging um, related to the work that you've been doing here around parking, parking requirements, and, and um, where we put it? Yeah, it's it's a really complicated issue. Um, there's, I think there's 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 two component. Well, there's three components of it. Um, for Americans who uh, park their cars in a garage at home, it's obviously not going to be a problem. They will most of them install a charger uh, of some kind at their at their home, and um, turns out that's one of the leading indicators of whether someone will buy an EV is whether they have um, a place to charge it at home. Not surprisingly, um, but that, of course, is a major uh, is going to be a serious impediment to EV adoption, especially in cities. Um, and because, uh, you know, one in three Americans and one in three households doesn't have uh, a personal home garage. Right. So what are we going to do? That's tens of millions of households. What are we going to do about all those people? Um, are we just going to leave behind, uh, you know, all these major cities, which with their terrible pollution problems and, and consign everybody to, to driving gas powered cars for the next um, 30, 50 years? Like, I, I hope not. But on the other hand, um, there are some serious obstacles to adapting multifamily buildings for EV charging. It's expensive and um, owners don't always want to invest in it. Now that's changing now because it's perceived as a, a, a way to get uh, tenants into the door. Um, and, and certainly at condo buildings, um, you do have people um, getting excited about the possibility of in installing chargers, but it does require, you know, digging through a lot of concrete and sometimes upgrading the entire building's um, electrical capacity and cost, you know, cost $10,000 a, a charger. And then in condo buildings too, you have this question of ownership, right? Like um, because each parking spot tends to be associated with a single unit, um, it's not clear how you would install chargers that could be shared. And I think it would be really, really good um, and, and much more efficient and much more low cost if we could not repeat with uh, EV parking the mistakes we made with regular parking, which is to say providing uh, way too much of it at an enormous cost. Um, so it would be great to, to find a way for people to share those chargers in, in those multifamily buildings. Um, and then finally, when it comes to the on-street situation, on-street installations have been horrendously expensive. Um, and obviously there, installing a charger for every single on-street parking space is totally infeasible. And, and, and there the question is, you really do have to um, find a way to get people to change their parking habits because 
um, you are going to need to have a good amount of chargers where the practice is that people show up and they charge for a couple hours and then they move on. Um, and that's going to need to be enforced on a citywide scale, this kind of shuffling, because otherwise, um, I, I just don't think that it's going to work. And we're going to end up leaving behind a lot of these neighborhoods where people park on the street. Indeed. It's the new frontier um, for a lot of us, I know, when it comes to EVs. I want to ask a couple of questions around some of the conflicts. Again, again judging from the audience we know is here, people have um, uh, are kind of focused on where some of these reform ideas might conflict with some of the things that, that, that they're interested in. There's a bunch of comments around kind of micro-mobility, the Vision Zero um, efforts in, in different cities. Do you see any kind of conflict between parking reforms um, and those initiatives, especially around safety? You talked a little bit around um, clearing the intersections and, and sight lines around intersections, but do you see any conflicts between new mobility tools and safety concerns and the provision of parking? On street. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I tend to think that, uh, it, uh, you know, have you ever heard of the, the sort of sidewalk theory? which is that uh, when sidewalks were first rolled out, they were, they were really designed um, to meet um, ADA requirements or at least to accommodate people in wheelchairs. Um, but then once sidewalk, uh, excuse me, sidewalks, what am I saying? Curb cuts, curb cuts. Um, once curb cuts were, were originally designed to, to accommodate people in, in wheelchairs who were trying to cross the street. Uh, but subsequently, um, cities that had begun to install curb cuts began to realize um, that uh, curb cuts could in fact be used by a whole variety of street users and that um, people would actually seek them out as they were crossing the street, and especially people who you know, were pulling anything on wheels, whether it was uh, a dad with a stroller, or a mom with a shopping cart, or, 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 or a kid riding a bike. Um, and so uh, you began to see that this uh, infrastructural feature that had been created for a specific group uh, wound up being used by a much larger group. And I think this is the way that I think about um, safe streets improvements as well, which is that um, we shouldn't be too territorial when we're creating, for example, a bike lane, right? Like that should be thought of as a kind of um, mid-speed mobility lane that's available for, um, you know, uh, really anyone who, who wants it or, or needs it. And, um, and so I think that, you know, that space should be opened up for certainly for, for e-bikes. And I think this is one of the big um, this is a huge moment of potential right now. Like in Europe, e-bikes are now outselling um, e-cars, right? Um, and, and one of the reasons, of course, is that they're very easy to park. Uh, so they're really convenient if you have to run an errand into a uh, congested downtown. They're also convenient for hauling kids around. And you see that everywhere in Paris and Amsterdam and Zurich, like um, moms with two kids on the back of their bike taking the kids to school. Now, that should be possible in most American suburbs because while the commute distance is large, uh, many other distances are not so large. And so I think that um, when we think about adapting streets, micro mobility in all its forms is exactly what we should have in mind. Like if the streets are safe for golf carts, they'll, they're going to be safer for people on bikes. I mean, so I think all of those uh, all of those people, even though cyclists and pedestrians are often um, at odds. Uh, are really allies in 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 the battle to try and take back a little bit of that street space from cars. We have about ten minutes left. I want to uh, lump a couple of questions here together. Uh, you know, you could again imagine from our group, there's a lot of questions around governance issues, and we've talked a bunch about what happens on the local level and city level and how um, they can affect their own parking rules and regs. Uh, it, do you see that there's a state role here? I'm asking that one. That's that's my question. But then a lot of folks want to know, what about the federal role? Is there anything that the federal government can do? I believe there was legislation that was introduced earlier this year um, for some kind of parking reform. But how do, you, how do you think about governance when it comes to the reform ideas you're talking about here? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think the federal, there was a federal bill introduced um, by a congressman from California to abolish parking requirements nationwide. I am not a constitutional law scholar, but I don't think that's going to work. Um, that said, uh, federally, the federal government could do a lot, both through HUD and through the DOT, um, to uh, try and encourage places to move away from uh, this type of bad planning. Like, um, you know, they should definitely start compelling 
state departments of transportation to stop requiring that every you know main street running through an american downtown have a speed limit of 50 miles an hour right like i'm exaggerating a little bit but like state dot's are really bad actors here and they're really focused on getting cars from from one place to another and uh and they don't really care about anybody else and and that's a place where i think you know if we had for example a small town former small town mayor uh in at the helm of the dot he might for example begin to to to, to put some put some pressure on local officials to to make better decisions and as far as hud goes um hud is uh helps a lot of multifamily developers with financing and hud is pretty pro parking last time I checked. So um, they uh, could also um, uh, compel jurisdictions and developers to move their projects in the right direction and or at least permit them to, to do so if they if they decide to. And right now, the case is HUD is often pushing for, for more parking um, uh, at the state level. I think the, the benefit of having the state act on this issue, which has happened in California and Washington and Oregon, um, is that uh, you take this is not just about parking, but it's about land use and transportation more broadly. Um, in places where the housing market is really tight and people are afraid of the impact on their community if they decide um, to uh, upzone, for example, their neighborhood to allow for duplexes, upzone up their downtown to permit taller buildings, et cetera, um, they shouldn't feel that they have to go first, right? Like it's a prisoner's dilemma where everyone would be better off if everyone built more housing. But no jurisdiction, rightly, I think, uh, wants to be the one to say, all right, we'll do it. Because then you do wind up sort of being flooded with new development and, and you do take, take you know, function as a, as a pressure release valve for this um, messed up problem that tends to be metro wide or even statewide. And I think that's the advantage of the state acting is that they can say uh, all across California now in every neighborhood, um, that, that buildings can be built without parking if, if developers choose to build them that way. And I think so taking that decision out of the local authorities' hands, I think, is, is, is pretty good politics. Challenging to do, but, but agree, it would be I say effective. good good policy, maybe challenging politics. <laughs> policy. Right, probably what they were saying. Um, so a couple of questions around technology and the role of advanced technology. It, obviously, the transportation system is going through a technological revolution in a lot of different ways. There is parking. There are new parking apps. There is parking, um, just new, new, new things that are being used to both pay for parking and look for parking. You know, how, how do you think about the role of advanced technology? Folks are specifically asking about vertical um, parking. How do you think about the kind of the future um, of all of this? Um, I I grew up in Manhattan, so um, I got to see like the. First of all, my parents had a car that was parked in a garage that had an elevator, which was, you know, relatively unusual um, since demolished to make way for a condo building. Um, but uh, but also there were a lot of lots that had those uh, metal um, structures, you know, car elevators would stack the stack the cars on top of each other. And um, you do see both car elevators and more complicated ways of uh, storing parking. Um, uh, you see those uh, developed in like skyscrapers in Brick Hell in Miami, which is like a weird combination of both like really high real estate values and really car dependent. So it's got these skyscrapers where, you know, there's probably at least a car in there for every um, single unit. Uh, but of course, the problem with rolling out these uh, devices at scale is that parking is really, really uh, expensive to build. And, uh, and those kinds of um, space saving innovations are really, really expensive and people's willingness to pay for parking, a few edge cases aside, um, people's willingness to pay for parking is really, really low. So, uh, there's really just not that many places where, um, it's going to pencil out to build any kind of, uh, complicated car infrastructure. There's not even that many places where it pencils out to build a garage. I mean, the amount of free, like freestanding garages built just to make money from parking. Uh, that basically never happens. I mean, it just does not make sense um, it, it, almost anywhere. So if it doesn't pay to build a garage, it's certainly not going to pay to come up with anything else more complicated. How about payment technologies? Do you see a role with new payment technologies and parking well, innovation, the, maybe pricing mechanisms, things like that? Yeah, one of the things that excites me about payment technologies is that, um, like for years, uh, cities have been focused on parking as a way to make money. And so the 
primary parking policy has been designed to wring as much money from motorists as possible. And that actually often doesn't mean by raising meter rates high enough that the streets are cleared and there's always an available spot. On the contrary, it often means um, making sure that uh, you're, you're getting as many people parking illegally as possible because most cities make more money from illegal parking citations uh, than they do from the meters themselves, right? So this is a, a big issue. And I think with uh, technology, you, you have the opportunity to restructure the system, right? Like there's no reason that when I pay for parking, I shouldn't get my money back when I leave the spot, right? Like that is an example of charging for parking in a way that's designed to make money, right? If you want to, if what you actually want to do is organize the street, which is in fact the original goal of the parking meter and should be the goal of city planners today, then when I leave my parking spot after an hour and a half, even if I paid for three hours, you should give me back the extra hour and a half that I paid for, right? Um, and that's an example of a change that I think could warm up people to the idea of parking reform and establish city planners' good intentions uh, for what they what they intend to do um, with their with their parking systems. Um, another thing this opens up the possibility for is doing LPR license plate uh, reading, um, which can be done by a car with a camera on top, which drives down the street, scans everybody's license plate, checks it against the register of who's paid for parking, and issues tickets by mail. And that can be done in ten seconds on a city block, as opposed to a parking attendant who a uh, parking enforcement officer who might take, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes to do that. Um, now, one of the reasons uh, illegal parking citations are so expensive is because they need to have a deterrent effect. Uh, and you can only issue so many of them when you have a team of um, paid city employees who are in charge of doing this. But if you, if a city were to convert to LPR and the issuance of tickets became more regular and more reliable, then tickets wouldn't need to be so expensive. You know, and so I think you you could drop the ticket price from from you know sixty dollars, eighty dollars a ticket, down to twenty twenty five, right? It should just be a reminder that you should have parked uh, legally, but it should be a reminder that you receive pretty regularly um, as you park illegally. I can tell folks have, have read some folks have read the book. There's some comments here about I think it's in your book. We you talk about New York is it tw makes twice as much from parking fines than the fees that people pay for parking. Is it New York that's the Really, really alarming was, and amazing stat. I remember when I read that. Yeah, it was true in Chicago before they before the parking meter deal as well. Um, I assume it's true in, in, in a great many other cities as well, yeah. Comments about the parking meter deal too. I know that's covered well in the book too, but in the last two minutes here, let me just ask you kind of just kind of one question. I know that a lot of folks are, are wondering about that. What is the, maybe it's not enough time too, but what is then the tipping point for places so that they can engage? This does seem to be, um, a policy idea, some initiative that's getting a lot of attention now. What is the tipping point for places that actually start to pursue innovative parking policy? I think there's been two primary motivators for activists who are working on this issue, and it's uh, housing and it's the environment. And places where housing is really expensive, the decision to prioritize parking over housing becomes more and more obscene. And um, even people who really love their parking spots begin to recognize that. And and their decision to, to say, no, we need this parking lot instead of a, a new building um, becomes harder and harder to defend in public. So I think that's that's one thing that's 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 getting change to happen. And, and the other is obviously the environment. And we know that parking creates driving. It creates um, all the externalities associated with driving, including local pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, pedestrian injuries um, and, and just the general unpleasantness of, of traffic. And, and so, um, for people concerned about those issues as well, um, th those can be major motivators in deciding to change the status quo. Now, in terms of when, uh, when a place tips from being, uh, really, really concerned about parking to, to not, I mean, it never happens, right? Like, you know, even New York city, which has like, uh, the best mass transit, best pedestrian, environment in the United States, um, people still go ballistic about parking, but it's a small minority of people. They unfortunately wield a great amount of political power, but uh, it really is a, a small group of people. And I think, you know, what you notice is as, uh, as you know, it's about parking and about land use and about transportation and about housing, um, people become less reliant on, on their cars. And you begin to see uh, people make decisions not to use their cars as much. And there is a kind of um, cycle of virtuous 
I don't want to say virtuous. I don't want to make a value judgment here, but uh, there is a, 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 a cycle of positive reinforcement there that happens. Um, you get rid of parking, people decide to make trips other ways, and then you uh, emerge with an environment that's more pedestrian friendly, uh, simply because there's so many more people uh, walking and biking and, uh, and, and, and so on. And so that, that, that does happen, right? I mean, we've seen that in cities that have made decisions to provide less parking over the last 50 years. They, that tends to be correlated with a, a more friendly environment for pedestrians. There do seem to be better examples of uh, positive ideas from our positive um, results from these reforms than, than negative. Maybe that's just the, the company I'm keeping, but it does seem to be a lot of interest in that too. And I, I again, just want to thank you so much, Henry, for, for this fantastic um, presentation. I want to thank everybody for, for the questions. You know, we barely got to scratch the surface, but what I really liked about this conversation is that it kind of connects this, this transportation issue and one kind of, you know, one, one niche transportation issue to all these big things that are dominant in the national discourse right now, the environment, housing, all the things you talked about. So thank you so much, Henry. Uh, and thank you for the plug for Mr. Eno and his role in all this, positive and negative. Um, he definitely has a long, a long reach in this. Um, and for folks who are listening, we are going, this uh, presentation will go up on Eno's YouTube website. website. You should find that pretty easily. The, the slides and the, and the discussion will all be up there. Uh, and if you'd like more information about Eno, you can check out our website at www.enotrans.org. And when you're there, check out Eno Transportation Weekly, which is our flagship publication and an indispensable resource on all aspects of transportation policy and practice. So once again, Henry, thank you so much for taking the time. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Robert. All right. Take it easy, everybody.